It is true, let me confirm the rumors. Today is, in fact, my 38th birthday. <laughs> I wanted to start uh, my sermon this morning by sharing with you 21 things that I have learned in the last 38 years of my living. Number one, asking for help isn't a sign of weakness, it's a sign of intelligence. Number two, just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. Number three, don't make fun of your wife's decisions, you're one of them. Number four, life is a lot like looking for your phone, most of the time it's in your hand. Number five, what matters most is not the dates on your tombstone, but instead the impact you make with the dash in between. Number six, if you want to avoid conflict, it's easy. Be nothing, say nothing, and do nothing. Number seven, do things that matter with people that you like. Number eight, the loudest boos generally come from the cheapest seats. Number nine, the reason your windshield is bigger than your review mirror is because where you're headed is more important than where you've been. Number 10, we can forgive the unforgivable in others because Christ has forgiven the unforgivable in us. Number 11, it's okay to stop explaining yourself to people who are committed to misunderstanding you. Number 12, no one is too far gone for God to redeem. Number 13, God isn't looking for experts. He's just looking for the ava available. Number 14, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. Number 15, second chances is all God knows how to give. Number 16, blessed are the flexible, for they will not break. Number 17, if you're going through hell, keep going. Number 18, showing kindness to people who could never repay you is the hallmark of authenticity. Number 19, you don't have to attend every argument you're invited to. Number 20, playing a wrong note is unavoidable, but to play without passion is inexcusable. And in closing, number 21, and maybe most important, communism has never worked anywhere it has ever been tried. Yeah, first and Second Chronicles was written by a man named Ezra who functioned as both a scribe and a priest who helped author the history of the nation of Israel. Yeah, these books tell the story of a time when kings ruled over the land. Starting with Saul and, and then to David and then Solomon and others, Ezra recounts the story of a nation who constantly finds themselves trapped within the cycle of blessing that leads to comfort, comfort that leads to complacency, complacency that leads to rebellion, and rebellion which leads to bondage. And Second Chronicles 20, in fact, tells us the story of a man named Jehoshaphat who at the age of 35 finds himself thrust into the national spotlight when his father, the king of Judah, unexpectedly dies. And starting in verse 1 of chapter 20, this is his story. And it happened after this that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon and the others with them came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And then some people came and they, they told Je Jehoshaphat that there is a vast army coming against you from the land of Edom from the other side of the Dead Sea. And, and Jehoshaphat was afraid. So he set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. See, Jehoshaphat is royalty. His great, great, great grandfather was a man named King David. And now the scepter of leadership has been passed to him by virtue of his father's death. 
But Israel is not the same nation it was when David sat on the throne so many years ago. The country is torn in two. A civil war has broken out. Jehoshaphat is trying to honor God. He's trying to figure out how to lead. He's trying to figure out how to hold together a fragile coalition of warring factions. He didn't ask for this job, but now that he has it, what is he to do? So Jehoshaphat has an idea. Because he has an understanding of what has made Israel historically great, he therefore has a clue on on how to restore the shine to a nation who has lost its way. So Jehoshaphat gets to work, and, and the first thing that he sets out to do is to demolish the altars to Baal and to tear down the Asherah poles. <laughs> oh, the people are fine with his economic reforms. The citizens are excited with his spending on infrastructure. But all of hell breaks loose against Jehoshaphat when he decides to deal with idolatry. Now hear me, friend, the devil is A-OK with your compromise because a compromised Christian is controlled opposition. And as long as the enemy can park idols in your backyard, he'll unleash hell through your front door. Israel was under a curse. The worship of Yahweh had been replaced by the capitulation to pagan deities. And whether you live in Israel or whether you live in America, the result is the same. You become like that which you worship. Gods who cannot see or hear produce a people who are spiritually blind and deaf. Or oh, idols, they go by different names, but our country is no less idolatrous today than Israel was 3,000 years ago. Their names have changed, their influence has grown, but the task of the church remains the same. Go to the high places, tear down the false idols, and turn the nation back to God. I think it's a time of choosing in America again. It is either tyranny or Torah. It is chaos or it is covenant. It is revival or we die and I choose revival. In 1831, a French aristocrat by the name of Alexis Tocqueville traveled to America to try and understand, amongst other things, what made America the most compelling experiment in self-governance that the world had ever seen. In writing his memoirs later in life, Tocqueville said this, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her harbors and her ample rivers, but it was not there. In her fertile fields and, and, and boundless forests, but it was not there in her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, but it was not there. No, not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and her power. America is great because she is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. If we have strong churches, we will have strong families. If we have strong families, we will have strong cities. And if we have strong cities, we can have a strong nation once again. But what makes America great is not our money or our might or even the profundity of our founding documents. What makes America great is that there are still pulpits that preach truth. There are still people that fear God and there are still churches that worship Jesus. Yes, even on Super Bowl Sunday. Israel teeters on chaos. The people, they are steeped in rebellion. So when everything else fails, Jehoshaphat announces to Judah, it is time to seek the Lord again. 
Ian Bounds says it like this, the church is looking for better methods, but God is looking for better men. And I'm here to remind you, friend, prayer still works. Seeking God still works. Fasting and dedicating yourself to the Lord, it still works. See, God doesn't hear our prayers as much as he hears our desperation. And in his most desperate hour, Jehoshaphat returns to the one thing that he knows. He calls upon the name of the Lord and dares him to show up again. And the story continues in verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord and he prayed, Lord, God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? Do you not still rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? The fourfold rhetorical questions of Jehoshaphat serve as a proclamation of faith for the entire assembly of Judah and Jerusalem. Are you not the God above? Do you not rule the nations below? Is there not power in your hand? And are you not the one who gave us this land? See, friend, it's when I recount the faithfulness of God from my last season that I have the courage to face the crisis of my current season. Is he not the God who has healed your body? Is he not the God who has saved your soul and renewed your mind and rescued your kids and broke your bondages and forgiven your sin you know what I love about church it gives us the corporate opportunity to retell the story of God's unbroken faithfulness from one generation to the next I leave encouraged I leave built up I leave with a fresh sense of hope that the God who did it before can do it again and in verse 12 Jehoshaphat continues his prayer. Our God, will will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. I love this. Watch. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. I love the honest faith of a 35-year-old king named Jehoshaphat. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are set on you. It reminds me of the father of the boy who is severely demonized in Mark 9 when Jesus says, do you believe? And he responds, I believe, but help my unbelief. I'm not sure how this problem is going to be solved. I don't know how this situation is going to change. I don't know what, but I do know who. Is setting your eyes on Jesus means that in the midst of of that which could depress and that which could deter and that which could discourage like a camera lens adjusting to its target I am setting my focus on the Lord because when I do everything that is not him appropriately diminishes in its ability to distract It's like the things of earth grow strangely dim. I've locked eyes with the one who gives me strength in the midst of my difficulty. And my prayer for for this community comes from Psalms 119 and verse 37 where David says, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless idols and revive me in your way. See, when we're in trouble, 
So often we want an answer from Jesus. But we so often forget that the answer is Jesus. I don't need God to work a transition in my timeline as much as I need a God who walks with me in the middle of my mess. Just give me Jesus and I'll be okay. I don't want my preaching to offer you tips and tricks and principles and programs and entertain you and have you end up leaving this room the same. I want the proclamation of the gospel to point you to Jesus. He is the author and the finisher, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. And to the one who has already been wherever I am going, I can trust my unknown future to the one who holds every waking moment of my life. And it's my conviction that so many people gather on Sunday mornings and they get from the pulpit what they can receive from TikTok. They get from a communicator what they can receive from Instagram. It's a lot of human wisdom. It's a lot of carnal knowledge, but it ain't a lot of Jesus. And it's like I feel the cry of the congregations of America. Just give me Jesus. Just give me hope. Just give me one who had the power to get out of the grave. Save me from the stories and the analogies. Just give me him. Now watch verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, a descendant of Zechariah, a Levite, and a descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. And he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, for this is what the Lord would say unto you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for this battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. <laughs> I love this. The king is praying, the, the people is listening. The community is worried as as families huddle together, wondering if destruction awaits them at the hands of their enemy. And as a hush falls over the crowd and, and a nervous energy vibrates through the gathered masses, the spirit of the Lord rushes in on a man named Jehaziel, a grandson of Levi, a member of the priesthood, and he raises his voice to prophesy. Let me prophesy to you this morning, pursuit. This battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. This building is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. This lease payment is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. This region is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. And Jesus says in John 10, if something belongs to the Lord, the enemy cannot snatch it out of his hand. The problem is we try to own that which God has only ever asked us to steward. It ain't mine. It'll never be mine. It'll always be his. And there is great comfort in being a steward of his church instead of an owner of his church. Because if God owns it, it's his job to fill it. It's his job to provide for it. It's his job to grow it. And it's his job to build it. And you can rest easy tonight because the one who does not sleep nor does he slumber is still in the business of building his church in such a way that the gates of hell cannot, will not, shall not prevail against it. The battle belongs to the Lord. And because he is outside of time and space, 
That means he is in our past, in our present, in our future. And he knows how your story ends. And I would venture to tell you this morning, friend, your story ends a lot better than it started. It might look impossible, but you've got a secret weapon named the High Lord of the Heavens who commands the angel armies of above. And he is working on your behalf. Yahweh is still today the competitive advantage for every believer because everywhere the sole of your foot treads God will give you the land he makes tables for you in front of your enemies he causes wells of living water to spring up in the wilderness manna to rain down from heaven he'll guide you by a cloud and a fire by night this God has never failed and he won't start now and watch 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 and when he had consulted with the people Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor and the beauty of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. This is a crucial moment that will determine whether or not the people of the southern kingdom of Judah continue to live free and raise their kids in prosperity. Jehoshaphat has called for a convocation of the nation. They have gathered in Jerusalem at the steps of the temple. Jehoshaphat is addressing the people, but he doesn't have much to say outside of we got to seek the Lord, pray him fast because we need him to show up in a big way. A young man named Jehaziel, a grandson of Levi, begins to prophesy. And after he's done prophesying, the attention of the congregation shifts back to the king. And he gets ready to unveil the grand plan on how they are going to defeat three different foreign armies that have all converged for one focal point of attack. And here it is. We're going to go to PCO. We're going to schedule the dudes from the choir. They're going to stand in front of the army. And we're going to march out to meet the Ammonites and the Edomites. And here's what they're going to do. When they get within a stone's throw of the front lines of the enemy... They're going to begin to sing. And their song is going to be simple. It's going to be about a sentence and a half. It's not an imprecatory song. It's not a song of judgment against the invading armies of darkness. It's not a song of strategy that helps those who are shooting the arrows or holding the shields know where to Stand. It's a song of praise unto the living God. Give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures for, I don't know about you, but if I'm standing in the crowd, I'm thinking to myself, is this really it? Are you telling me that the future of my children and my children's children is wrapped up in the strategy of praise and worship? And Jehoshaphat says, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm declaring. If mom and dad will worship, their sons and daughters will walk in freedom. If their sons and daughters will worship, their grandchildren will walk in freedom. This is the strategy. It's always been the strategy give thanks unto God for he is good and his mercy endures forever I I wish I could stand before you today and, and give you all the nice sounding strategies that all start with the same letter that if you just employ them in your life all of your problems will be solved But the same thing that worked back then is the same thing that works today where God will find a people who with unabandoned resolve will allow the worship of their lips to minister to his heart to rise as sweet incense before the throne room of heaven. That is a God who will intervene on behalf of those type of people and in doing so make a way where there seems to be no way. It's interesting, watch. In Psalms 118, Moses sings in the wilderness 
when the people cross through the Red Sea. Do you know what his song is? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. In Psalms 136, David declares in Jerusalem when the ark comes back home, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. In 2 Chronicles 5, Solomon sings before the nation when the temple is completed. And do you know what that song is? For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. And now, in 2 Chronicles 20, 40 years after Solomon sung it, 100 years after David sung it, 430 years after Moses sung it, a 35-year-old young man named Joseph. Jehoshaphat, while surrounded by his enemies, with the walls closing in, and his adversaries advancing, bows his face low to the ground and begins to sing a familiar tune. Give thanks to the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. And watch this, 400 years later, in Ezra 3 and 11, a man named Zerubbabel would lay the foundation stone for the rebuilding of the temple. And as that stone was set in the ground, the people of Israel began to cry aloud, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Watch, watch. For nearly a thousand years from the exodus of Moses, to the rebuilding of the second temple, a song has been reverberating within the hearts of the Hebrew children. Its lyrics repeated across the hymn book of a nation. Its poetic tune seared within the mindset of a people. A cultural idiom enmeshed with supernatural truth. It wasn't a long song, but it did the trick. Because long after the Red Sea would part, the song of Moses became the soul of Jehoshaphat and God once again used a declaration of praise to defeat the enemies of Israel. Hear me friend what one generation declares another generation can build upon. Oh gratitude isn't just a good idea. Proclamation isn't just a good idea. Prophecy, worship, prayer isn't just a good idea. These are declarations of faith that are becoming foundations for our future so that for the next thousand years, people from all across this region will proclaim, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. 43 times in the scripture, the phrase give thanks is repeated. Because although thankfulness might not change my circumstance, it'll definitely change me. And that, my friends, is the sanctifying point of the gospel. God loves you enough to take you right where you're at, but, but he loves you too much to leave you the same Someone asked me the other day, they said, Pastor, how, how do I get the right things in my life to begin to open up? I said, it's simple. Start by giving God thanks for what you got right now. If you're believing God for the right job, start thanking Him for the one you got now. If you're believing God for the right house, start thanking God for the one that you've got now. If you're believing God for the right position, start thanking God for the one that you've got right now. If you're believing God for the right spouse, start thanking him for the one you got now. No, I'm just kidding on that one. I got you. Some of you were there. You said, thank you, Lord. I just we will pray for you at the end. Now watch, gratitude is a key that opens the door to abundance and gratitude is a sword that defeats comparison and complaining in my life. No, we don't give thanks for all things, but instead in all things. We don't thank God for sickness. We thank God in the midst of sickness. We don't thank God for trials. We thank God in the midst of trials. We don't thank God for difficulty. I thank him in the midst of difficulty. And if I can have gratitude, then I can have peace. And if I can have peace, then I can have joy. 
And if I can have joy, then I can have hope. And if I can have hope, I can face tomorrow. There was a man by the name of Horatio Spafford who knew a thing or two about giving thanks in the midst of life's unexpected challenges. Horatio was born in 1828 in upstate New York and would come to know Christ at a fairly young age. As he got older, Horatio discovered a love for the legal system and trained to be a lawyer before moving to Illinois where he would go on to become a prominent attorney at a large law firm. Horatio would would marry a woman named Anna. They, They would have four beautiful daughters and they would begin to invest in real estate, building wealth for his family and their future. Oh, everything was going well in Horatio's life until the evening of October 8th. When at 8.30 p.m., the great Chicago fire of 1871 would break out and destroy one-third of downtown Chicago, including every real estate investment property that Horatio and Anna owned. After three long days, the great Chicago fire would finally burn itself out. With hundreds dead and close to 18,000 buildings destroyed, the only thing Horatio wanted to do was to get his family out of town. So Horatio had an idea. He would book tickets for him, his wife, and their four young daughters to travel to England by ship. And they would help assist the great D.L. Moody in his evangelistic crusades being held in Liverpool. Oh, a chance to travel to Europe, spread the gospel, take a vacation all at the same time. Sounded like a great distraction from the tragedy at home. But as departure time drew near, Horatio received bad news. He would have to stay behind to assist in the cleanup efforts in Chicago. So his family would have to travel to England without him. But pretty soon, the great Chicago fire and the loss of his houses would be the least of Horatio's heartbreak. Because while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship that carried his family was involved in a terrible collision. In the span of 12 minutes, the ship carrying Anna and her four daughters would sink. More than 220 people would lose their lives, including all four of Horatio's daughters. By some miracle, his wife Anna survived the tragedy. And upon arriving in England, she sent a now famous telegram to her husband that said, Saved alone, what shall I do? As soon as Horatio received the telegram, he immediately set sail for England. On the sixth night of his trip, as the ship was passing the midway point of the Atlantic Ocean, the captain of the ship, who was aware of the recent tragedy, summoned Horatio to the deck to tell them that they were now passing over the spot where the previous shipwreck had occurred and his children had perished. If he wanted to pay his respects, now would be the time to do it. Horatio thought about his daughters. He regretted ever sending them to London in the first place. He wished he could have held them close just one more time. And then to the shock and the surprise of the captain and those who watched at a distance, Horatio did the otherworldly. He sat down and he took out a journal and pen and he began to prophesy on paper as he wrote what would become one of the most famous hymns in the last 150 years of Christendom. (laughs) When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows Like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot. Thou hast taught me to know. It is well. It is well. With my soul. Though Satan should buffet. And though trials should come. 
Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has recorded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, it is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Don't tell me that worship can't be the greatest living legacy and testimony that you leave for a generation that you will not see. Don't tell me that worship can't be the very antidote that rescues you out of the miry clay and sets you on a firm foundation. Don't tell me that giving praise can't be a necessary ingredient in the renewal of your mind so that you can think like Christ. Oh, anybody can worship when times are good. Anybody can sing a little song when life is going their way. But who are the believers who are founded on the rock that is higher than I that say not if the storm comes, but when the storm comes, my allegiance belongs to Jesus. My worship belongs to Jesus. My praise belongs to Jesus. Because regardless of the storm around me, I got peace inside of me. It is well, it is well with my Maybe we could just sing that song, Adam. stay standing as we close this morning if you were to continue to read the story the men of Judah do exactly as they have been instructed the choir gathers they march up to the enemy's lines and they begin to sing for he is good and his mercy endures forever the story is so wild as they begin to sing 
confusion breaks out in the enemy's camp. And the Ammonites and the Edomites, they turn on each other and they begin to fight one another. And the Bible says such confusion breaks out that not one is left remaining alive and they do the work of Israel on their behalf. And I was reading that story this week and I thought to myself, isn't that what worship does? It confuses the hell out of a region. Isn't that what worship does? It confuses an enemy who thinks he gets to dominate your emotional state. Isn't that what worship does? It draws a line in the sand and says, I am not bowing at the altar of my pain. I am not bowing at the altar of my confusion. I am not bowing at the altar of what I don't understand. My life, my allegiance, and my fidelity belongs to a man named Jesus. And I wish I could stand here today and promise you that 2024 is only ever going to be filled with rainbows and unicorns and not a problem in sight. But if I were to be honest, this year is going to be filled with many developmental opportunities by which you and I get to make a decision. Where will we point the direction of our praise. I don't know about you, Kirkland, but I've found that there's no one else who cares for the contents of my soul like this man named Jesus. There's no one else that can heal me from the pain of my missed expectations outside of, of this Jesus. There, there ain't nobody else who can speak into my future, forgive my past, and empower my present like this man named Jesus. And I want the declaration of this church to reverberate within the corridors of this region that God has found a people who regardless of the specifics of the circumstance that they are in, the declaration of their life will be God is good and His mercy endures forever. How many of you are thankful today for the mercy of God? You didn't get what you deserved. You got what He deserves. He took your punishment. You got His reward. And every day is a good day when you've been raised from the dead. For He is good. And his mercy endureth forever.